Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of my favorite jokes, which I think I told you already, so you have to chuckle still, okay? One of my favorite jokes comes from the movie White Christmas. And it goes something a little like this. I once knew of a doctor, to which you all say, tell about him, do. Well, sad to say, one day he fell into a great big well. And now you say, well, that's too bad. Oh, no, it served him right. And you all say, why is that? Well, he should have tended to the sick and left the well alone. I had to start with a little doctor humor because St. Luke, the saint that the church recognizes today, evangelist of our Lord, was a physician. A physician of the body who was called to be a physician of the soul. And fortunately for him, there is no one righteous, no, not one. And therefore, there's no well for him to leave alone because he tends to the sin-sick souls of all people with the preaching of that heavenly medicine, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, St. Luke is unique, very unique amongst all of the New Testament writers because he is the only Gentile, the only Gentile evangelist, and the only Gentile writer in the epistles. He was born in the city of Antioch, possibly a slave, possibly free. We don't really know a whole lot about St. Luke because he doesn't tell us very much about himself. His eyes, his voice is focused on Christ. He was a physician by trade and by training and also a martyr of the faith. Maybe. Again, we don't know very much about St. Luke, but tradition tells us that he was hanged by an olive tree by idolaters in the city of Thebes. On the other hand, tradition also says he may well have escaped martyrdom and died at the age of 84, still quite respectable for a man even today, uh, in the city of Biotia. Now, St. St. Luke was also a disciple of the Apostle Paul, and he was a steadfast friend. We hear in, in our epistle lesson today that Paul says, Luke alone is with me. Now, having been on the missionary journeys with St. Paul, Luke undoubtedly was, was, well, he knew of two certain men that St. Paul mentions in our epistle reading, Alexander and Dumas, the likes of which we should not yet be like at all, but unfortunately, we probably are far too often like these two men. So are you ever, are you ever like Alexander the coppersmith, the one who strongly opposed the gospel? We do this in subtle ways, when we confuse law, what we should do, what we should not do, with gospel, it is the free gift of grace, forgiveness for the sake of Christ, who died for your sins and did all the work that is necessary. You see, whenever we turn this free gift of grace into a work of our hands, we rob Christ of His glory. We rob Him of the work that is singularly and wholly His, the redemption of the world by His holy, precious blood and by His innocent suffering and death. For if we were able 
in part or in whole, to secure reconciliation with God through good works, it would have been absolutely unnecessary, pointless, for Christ to become man and to suffer and die. You see, the works of sinful man are in no way able to secure the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, or salvation from eternal damnation. Our works are like filthy rags. As Isaiah said, we have all become like one who is unclean. Our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. But now you might say, well, what about James, right? What about James? Thank you. What about James? Doesn't James say we need to do good works? Well, no. He doesn't say we need to do good works. See, Scripture, the Holy Spirit, is very precise. He means what he says. He says what he means. And he says it in the way that he means. You see, James tells us, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Faith apart from works is dead. Now what St. James is warning against is the rejection of works, the rejection of the good works that the Holy Spirit has given to you. And this rejection is nothing less than the rejection of faith itself. As we hear in Ephesians chapter 2, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, to reject these good works to reject what God has prepared for you is to reject the new man, to reject the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, to reject the gospel, to be Alexander the coppersmith. Well, there are also times that we are perhaps like Dumas, that faithless disciple who was in love with this present world. And we are like Dumas whenever we're drawn away from the gospel, whenever we're enticed away from the church, whenever we are led astray from the sacraments, the very means by which God has appointed to forgive your sins, to strengthen your faith. Now, I'm not saying that the occasional skipping of church is going to end you in hellfire. No. Sometimes, you know, the, well, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And there are some for whom the flesh is truly weak, our brothers and sisters that are not able to come to be part of our fellowship here. And so then it is incumbent upon the church to come to them, to bring the fellowship, to bring Christ for church is not just the building, the pews, the hymnals. Church is the body of Christ. And each one of us is made for fellowship, made for communion. For a Christian cannot truly be a Christian by themselves. A Christian must be in relationship, relationship with God and relationship with each other. Now I'm also saying though that while an occasional skipping church is not such a bad thing, I do want to caution you, don't abuse the freedom you have in the gospel. The freedom that says, this Sunday I'm going to go to the beach. Well, just make sure that every once in a while doesn't become every so often, 
most of the time, all of the time. And if you find yourself all of the time not being at church, or even most of the time, repent. And if you find yourself giving leave for others not to be part of church, if you tell them it's fine, you don't need to come, you don't need to receive the sacraments, you can study the word and, and that is sufficient. Repent. We are to call them into fellowship, to call our brothers and sisters to be in the presence of God, to hear his preaching, his word, to receive his sacraments, the ways in which he helps to strengthen us, to forgive us, to make us whole. If you will, the holy prescription that St. Luke has written out and the holy prescription that Christ Jesus has given of himself in body and blood. If you find yourself doing these things, repent. For there is no shame in confession. There is only forgiveness. For if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins no doubt about it, no question about it, no condition, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So perhaps it's best that we would be like another man who is dear to St. Luke, the man to whom he has dedicated his gospel and his record of the Acts of the Apostles. His introduction to the Gospel bears, uh, bears the name of this man. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And see, that's the point of St. Luke's Gospel, to give Theophilus certainty, assurance, confidence in the Gospel, confidence in the things that he has been taught. And while he also addresses the start of the book of Acts to Theophilus, I think it's perhaps the conclusion where St. Paul speaks of the purpose, the purpose of recording these acts. Quoting St. Paul, Luke writes, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. It is as if St. Luke Dr. Luke has written a prescription, the heavenly medicine to cure the sin-sick soul in the gospel of Christ Jesus, a Gentile gospel and the Gentile record that our Lord Christ may come to the Gentiles. Here, Theophilus, take two books and call God in the morning. See, you, my brothers and sisters, while you may at times be Alexander, repent. And while you may at times be Dumas, repent. For in Christ, you are Theophilus. You have been baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. You have confessed your sins. And I, by virtue of my office, and by the command and in the stead of my Lord Jesus Christ, have forgiven you your sins. You have received his word into your hearts, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That very word preached here today. And now, 
you will receive his true body and his most precious blood. At the supper where he stands both as priest and sacrifice to forgive your sins, to strengthen your faith. You, brothers and sisters, are indeed Theophilus, for the name itself literally means friend of God. But you are also so much more than Theophilus. You are children of God, heirs of the promise, heirs of the heavenly kingdom. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.